So what are the differences between the original prototype and the second version? Now the first thing that we had that kind of distinguished this from this when they were semi-automatic was the trigger lock. Now why would you want to leave the trigger lock in place? Because people will complain about how it uh, impedes the action, it makes it a little less smooth, etc, etc, etc. Playtesting. So I gave this to children to play with, and uh, big surprise, that happened uh, more than one time during play, which resulted in jam, and you have to stop play, you have to clear the jam, etc, etc, etc. So if you loom one of these out, inevitably somebody's going to do this, and that just jammed it. So it wasn't possible to leave the physical block in here with the original trigger, with the original switch setup, because they were too vertical. So that took the place of the physical trigger block. But if you flip it horizontally, that allows you to cut the, the switch retention plate in half and you can mount it horizontally and that gives you enough space to A, leave the trigger block in place and B, mount the second switch. So that's how you can have that. Uh, the other big difference is the motor braking and that's kind of a, that's kind of a noise one. So since there's no motor braking on that circuit, it takes quite a while for the flywheels to spin down and that's making noise the entire time, whereas here, it's a lot quieter. Until you fire, of course. So I do like the motor braking circuit and uh, the trigger lock makes it a little more childproof during play, so that's a big plus. And lastly is the, the difference in the motor. So motor mounting differences aside, the motor orientation aside, the key difference was the different type of motor. So this used a stock Hyperfire flywheel motor, which gave me about, uh, I think, 400, 418 rounds per minute, which was about six to seven, I think, per second, but still very controllable. So you can snap off one round at a time. This is using the FF-130, and that gives a, I still have to do the calculations on the rate of fire, but the same trigger tap that would do that gives you three round burst. So if you like three round burst, great. You're gonna go through rounds a lot faster because there's no single semi-auto mode, um, which really kind of limits the usefulness of this during play. So if you're using this as a secondary, as a PDW, personal defense weapon, where you just need to pull it and spray off rounds real quick to hose down a crowd. Fantastic for that. If you're using it as a primary, then, I don't know, carry lots of magazines. The other problem with the really fast rate of fire is, um, as you saw with the drum magazine, the rate of fire is actually faster than the magazine's ability to feed the rounds. So, either you fire it upside down, or you use uh, stick mags. And I haven't tried this with anything better than the 12 round stick mags, so I couldn't even tell you whether the 18 rounds feed properly, but probably, assuming they're not dirty. So this is the V2 of the Auto Strife. We can see some minor modifications here. The trigger layout is different, starting with the basics. Trigger now has a physical block that prevents it from revving the automatic motor pusher. It's actually redundant because we do have motor braking enabled, which I will get into shortly after. But as it stands, physical trigger block engaged when the rev trigger is not open or closed. If we take a look at the bracket can see that this has been changed quite a bit. This little recess here is to allow for the opposite side of the shell to fit. You can see that this has been screwed in place, so the bracket is now attached to the gearbox. So that's not going anywhere. This bit here clips the also clips the gearbox in place. And you can tell by looking at the geometry here, you can see that the two pieces when they are screwed together clamps it in place and prevents it from moving anywhere. So it's not held in place by screwing it to the shell half, it is held in place by holding the two shells together.
One very important part to also note is that the motor has been flipped around, which is why the pinion or the rack gear is pushed all the way back here. And if you notice, this is flush in line with the slant, which allows it to feed properly. Like so, right to the edge. And this is important because if this push back too far, then this pinion gear will not engage with the rack because we are on a one tooth to one tooth mechanism. And you can see it goes to the end, it pushes right to the edge, so we get full stroke. That's what this little dot of glue is for. That is to keep the pusher arm in the correct position because if it pushes back too far, then it will no longer engage. It can also be done by adding more material here. That's the silicone to keep it from making too much noise. And you can also put a block here, which would keep the pusher head from retracting too far. But what we want is that flush position right there. So now we have our 2S65C battery. You can see that we have the motor braking engaged. And the rate of fire is significantly increased because of this FF-130 motor. And again, trigger cannot be engaged due to the physical block and also due to the motor braking circuit that we have in this circuit. Continuing on from the opposite angle, we can see that the two halves of the shell perfectly hold that brace and the gearbox in place. That will go here and everything will fit with the stock battery cover. So last we can see the fitment in the battery tray. So the plug is going to go up here and everything is completely solid, more solid than that hot glue solution in the last version. And with the internal material stripped out, we can see that we get a nice flush fit. The only thing that is kind of indicative of it not being stock are these 180 motors sticking out. And again, okay, we haven't screwed this thing together. We can see that uh, trigger does not engage until and we can do a test fire after we screw this together. So no chrono test, this is just a rate of fire test. And one, two, three. And you can tell that we're having feed issues with that uh, drum magazine. All right, since I'm on that last string, the rate of fire seemed to be limited by the magazine. We're gonna try running it upside down to get a better rate of fire. So what we're going to do rather than put titles on the screen this time is take a look at the time code and the audio spikes. So the audio waves are going to show us when each round was fired. And since each of these steps is 1 30th of a second, since we're shooting at 30 frames per second, we can see that that was a shot fired. So we're looking at roughly two frames per shot. So each of these little spikes represents uh, one actuation. So that would be 15, 15 rounds per second. And as you can see, we are starting to see the difference between those two frames increase in spike, which means it's actually firing a little faster than 15 rounds per second. By here, we're almost at the midway point for each two frames advanced. I'm not sure what that little hiccup is right there. I originally thought that that was the end of the cycle, but we can still see that there are darts clearing. And that, I think, is the last dart right there. And then nothing. So that's 25 darts, and that is firing about 16, 16 to 17 darts per second. But that's with the magazine inverted because the drums simply do not push rounds fast enough into the pusher.